How is the Passover Seder celebrated and what does it have to do with Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today. For the meal so simple, so meager, rallies about it as of yore, the members of the family, and with them their enthusiasm for the ancient faith, the scattered, even the indifferent, answer the call of Passover. Morris Joseph. Today we're going to continue our conversation about Passover and what actually celebrating Passover means and how we go through each of the different parts of it and what are the different parts of it. So again, I was raised Jewish, but I didn't ever believe in God, but I loved going to the temple and doing Passover with the temple. I think my parents weren't as excited about doing it. I don't think my mom cared much and my dad was very much against it, but I just loved doing the Passover Seder every time I could. And not only that, it's very participatory. The kids are involved quite a bit. Husbands and wives are involved quite a bit. And then the story is interactive. I just loved the entire thing. But first of all, we have to know that everyone's reclined. They're not supposed to be sitting at tables. So usually there's pillows and more of these lounging types of things. And then there is supposed to be this inspection that there is no yeast anywhere in the house. You'll see Passover in your grocery store. It has special matzah, special kinds of food groups that are special for Passover. means that they were inspected to ensure there wasn't any bit of yeast anywhere in these dishes. But in the family Passover, the husband was supposed to come in, search the house everywhere, But somewhere, the mother hid a piece of yeast. And so then eventually the the husband would find it and say, aha, I found it. And then there'd be like a ceremonial burning of it as he eradicated the last piece of yeast out of the house. So for a kid, this is a lot of fun. There's also four questions that are asked and the kids ask the question throughout the service. And You can imagine I'm a little bit of a talker there, and I was a little bit of a talker when I was a kid, but those four questions always meant so much to me because I loved participating, and it was supposed to be the youngest person to ask the question. And I remember one year, I got to be the youngest person, and not because I was the youngest person, but I was the youngest one who showed up, and I was excited to be a part of this. So the real question is, what makes this night so different from other nights? throughout the entire course of this meal, then these questions are answered. And so there's a Haggadah, which is going to be the booklet, the order of service that it comes with Passover to talk about what it is that they were supposed to do. On all other nights, we need not dip even once, but on this night, we dip twice. This is going to be salt water. And so you usually took potato and onion. We did uh, lettuce. And you would dip it into the salt water. And now you don't have to do that on every normal day, but you would actually dip it twice this meal because it's the tears that we cried when we were in Egypt. There's another dish that's called harosis, which is fruit, honey. It had um, nuts in it. It had maybe a little bit of wine. And so then you would be able to eat bitter herbs dipped into it so that you remember the cement that was used to create the bricks while you were slaves in Egypt. The sweet flavor takes away the bitterness of that herb, which was often um, horseradish, (laughs) at least was. And I don't remember dipping it in there. I remember just you had to eat the horseradish raw, which was never my favorite part. And the second question is that on most nights we eat hamets or matzah, but tonight we only eat matzah. Matzah was the bread of slaves It was easy to produce, but it was also without leaven because they had to flee quickly. They didn't have time to cook leavened bread, rising bread. So if you look at the Last Supper portrait, they all have real bread on there. That was not true. They would have had the unleavened bread. On all other nights, we eat any kind of vegetable, but on this night, we eat maror. And maror was a bitter herb. What we did in my temple is we had horseradish. It was probably the easiest bitter herb to get, but it's there to remind us of the bitterness of slavery. And then the fourth question, of all other nights, we eat sitting up or reclining, but on this night, we're all reclining, and that's because we're celebrating freedom. 
We're lounging around as free human beings. So the Seder starts off with the Kaddish, which is the sanctification prayer, where you're going to pray over the food and the wine. So there's going to be four cups of wine throughout this entire meal. And so then we're going to say it. And so each participant's cup is filled with wine or grape juice if you're a kid, and Mogan David, and the blessing is read. It's the same blessing that people read over the meals all the time. So they take their cup, they're leaning because they're free people. And so then they're able to take that first cup of wine. Then comes the purification, the hand washing, the ritual hand washing, which is to pour water over your hands. And then there's a blessing that is said about that as well. And then comes the questions for the children to ask. We in Christianity also have ritual washings as well, namely in baptism. Then comes the appetizer, which is always going to be that vegetable. And I saw some things online that said it could be a cucumber or radish or, you know, an onion. In our place, it was always a piece of lettuce. (laughs) And so you would take it and dip it in salt water, representing the tears that were shed during enslavement. Then comes the matzah. So there's a plate of three pieces of matzah, and they're stacked on the table. The matzah, that is the second matzah, is broken into two. The smaller parts, one half of it is broken up into smaller parts, and everyone there is given a piece of it. The larger half then becomes the afikomen, and then that's placed in that bag or napkins. We just wrap it in napkins. We didn't have a fancy bag. And then it was hidden somewhere in the house. And eventually the kids were sent out to go find it. They wouldn't know where it was hid. And anyone who found it usually got a prize. So that was always very exciting. If you look at it from a Christian point of view, the idea between the three matzahs was always meant to represent kind of unity between three things. And then suddenly, again, this is one of those Oh, I get it now. Christians say those are the three parts of God. The Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Old Testament. We know there's God the Father. And when we hear the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. And we'll find out why when we get to the Old Testament in the Bible in small steps. But you see the three persons of God in the Old Testament. And so what I think and I think what Christians think is these three pieces of matzah are there to represent God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The second one is pulled out, broken, handed out to everyone, take and eat, this is my body. And then the other part is hidden away, hidden in the grave, hidden in the, you know, in the ground, hidden from us in death. Jewish people would not agree with that, but as Christians, we go, oh, I get it now. So first then, the child will ask, why is this night different than all other nights? Now, we're going to get the four questions so that we can explain why this night is different than all other nights. And sometimes then, each of the 10 plagues are read out loud. And as they do that, they will dip their fingers into the wine and spread it on the plate. This is going to represent how they avoided one of the plagues of Egypt by putting blood on the door. And the sprinkling of the blood was a part of the way the sacrificial system worked, I guess. Moses took and sprinkled blood on the people and saying, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made for you according to all these words. But it is done at the time of discussing each of the plagues. And we're going to talk about the plagues here in just a moment, because there are really three plagues, I think, represented in the Passover Seder. Maror, the bitter herbs, like I said, we did uh, horseradish. You would take the horseradish or the bitter root, whatever it is, and then you would be able to take it and dip it in this what was called horosis thing, but it was apples and nuts and honey and wine, and it was very sweet. For kids, they didn't let us have the horseradish because it was terrible, except for baby who tries everything. Instead, you would get like a bitter leaf of lettuce. Then comes the dinner. So now we have the main dinner. It usually begins with a hard-boiled egg, which is dipped in the salt water, and the rest of the meal, whatever it is that you were going to serve during this particular meal. I think it was supposed to be, at one time, uh, the lamb, but again, meals can be anything. Then at the part of dessert, 
they go find the afikomen. And that part of that is kids go and find it. And then they're supposed to negotiate for some treat or a prize. And then a blessing is made over the meal. There is the singing of praises, which is talked about that Jesus and his disciples sang songs. And then finally, everyone has that fourth cup while reclining because now they're giving thanks as not slaves, but as children of God. And that's it. That's the Seder. And it's now over with. So one of the interesting things that happens, too, is that when the leader of the Seder recites a series of blessings after the meal, there is a third cup of wine that is poured out. And this one is poured out for the prophet Elijah. And a child goes and opens up the door and invites him to come in. Many times at Sabbath, a plate is set out for Elijah. Elijah was either considered to be the Messiah, because in theory, God took him up, never letting him die. Mostly was thought of as the person who was going to bring the Messiah. So you wanted Elijah to come into your home because if the Messiah is about to come back, you want to be the first to know. This is where it's always talking about when you see in the New Testament, people are like, to John the Baptist, is, is he Elijah? Is that who this is? We find out later he is not Elijah because Elijah shows up when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain. And people don't say, hey, look, that's John. John's a separate figure, but he is an Elijah-like figure. He dresses like Elijah. He is the Old Testament prophet telling people to repent and making the way clear so that Jesus can come to our world again. He is the Elijah of that time announcing the coming of Jesus. But boy, was I fascinated. Whenever they opened up the door, I was like, is something going to happen? Do we think something is going to happen? What's happening? Then Psalms are sung because obviously the book of Psalms is the Jewish songbook. You know, so there also what is always present in the Passover Seder is going to be the shank bone of a lamb that is meant to rep represent the lamb without blemish that is offered in sacrifice for the sins of the people. So it's supposed to be without blemish. It's also representing the lamb's blood that was on the doors of the Jewish people so that the angel of death would pass over when it comes to the plague. There are three separate plagues that are really focused on, I think, during the Passover Seder. Keep in mind that each of the plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians were representing a direct attack on each of the Egyptian gods. You blotted out the sun. You turned the Nile, which was a god, to blood. You destroyed the firstborn sun. So each of the ten plagues that was visited upon the Egyptian people represented one of their gods. And you can see when, when it comes to Jesus, you can see that some of the plagues are directly representative. We see the water turning into blood, which is represented in the wine. We see the darkness that came when the sun was blotted out. And then the last one is, is we see the firstborn son being killed, just as God's firstborn son was killed as well. So when the plagues and the Passover are described, we understand exactly what's going on in the meal and how it represents our vision of Jesus and how the entire meal represented what is about to happen to Jesus. Historically in Passover, the lamb was mentioned as saving the people from death. And it is a direct connection to what we believe in Jesus. Jesus' blood spread for us, spilled for us, poured out for us, is going to save us from death. In modern times, lamb is not emphasized anymore, I think, because of that connection to Jesus. And they don't want it to be confusing at all to the people there that we are talking about Jesus. But when you learn about the historical Passover, you're again getting, oh, I see what's going on here. But to us, the Passover lamb is everything, and it means everything to us. And so we get it. So we understand where God is going. Again, I believe that the moment sin entered the world from the Garden of Eden, God has been on a rescue plan to save us and bring us back. And this meal is a representation of that. It is a representation of how God saved his people in Egypt. And it's a, a representation of how God is going to save us from sin. 
We also see the part where Jesus is talking about dipping, and he talks about whoever dips the bread with me is the one who's going to betray me. So we see Jesus indicating there was dipping going on, which is part of the Passover Seder. Overall, I love the Passover Seder. Again, as a kid, it was just my favorite thing. And I had one of those movie moments where when I became a Christian, suddenly like my life flashed before my eyes and all the things that I learned about my Jewish faith, about growing up Jews, suddenly I'm like, oh, wait, what about that? What this? Oh my goodness, that makes sense now. And Passover was one of the very first things to me that suddenly made sense. And again, when we drink that fourth cup with Jesus, we're drinking as sons and daughters in heaven, not as slaves on earth, not slaves to sin or slaves to anybody. And boy, I love Passover and I hope you enjoy it too. It indicates to us, as Jeremiah said, that there would be a new covenant. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people, and I will remember their iniquity no more. So I hope you enjoyed this look at Passover Seder. Um, It's so crucial to this time of year, and it's why Jesus brought it in to be a part of his final time on earth with us as a human before his resurrected body. It meant something, I'm sure, to the apostles. I think when the apostles saw it, they had the same reaction of, oh goodness, I know what he's talking about. And it probably just all blew their minds about how they saw Passover now in a new light, in its full meaning. So my challenge to you is think about the Passover Seder and what ties you in that worship to Jesus? And why do you think he picked this particular time? It could have made sense for him to do it during Yom Kippur which is asking forgiveness. It could have come at a time of Hanukkah when God keeps his promises, even though it looks dire, but instead he picked this holiday. And think about what that means to you, that this particular holiday is when Jesus decided to highlight his ministry on earth and the day before he died. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please have a happy Easter. I know that this has been a long slog through history on this podcast. We'll go back to reading books next week. But I wanted to really highlight what this whole last week, this tension point, all built up to. This one week was rife with drama, political intrigue, conspiracies, and then the celebration of Passover. And I hope that it helped you understand a little bit better about why the Jewish faith in this time of Passover ties into our Easter so strongly. Thank you so much.